Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our week six um, technologies 2013 EDN lecture discussion, and probably the most important one because now we've gotten all the basic understanding out of the way, and you should have an understanding now of design and technology and digital technologies, design thinking and computational thinking, and now we're starting to explore what these mean in practice in the classroom through various design challenges and other activities. And of course, these relate to your level three and level four tasks as you start ramping up those, having hopefully completed all your level one and two tasks by now. And with us today, tonight, we have Ben and Cara, and anyone else who's watching on the online um, YouTube stream, if you could put your um, a message into the Google group, just to let us know that you're out there and watching. And of course, anyone is welcome to join us here on the panel. Um, you would have received an invite, or if you want to email me with an invite, I can then add you to our panel. And I see we have Bev and Kimberly watching online, which is great. Uh, no one else is trying to get in at the moment. Well, it looks that's OK. So this week, we're going to look at a whole range of different curriculum year level um, <coughs> modules, and we'll probably start with our Design and Technology um, DNT, um, was it DNT 3, F to 2. Yeah. Now in this module, I've, this particularly looks at our early years um, activities, and I've given a design challenge example of the waterproof clothing activity. So what I've done in the modules, and I've done this throughout all of the um, curriculum modules, is I've drawn out from the actual technologies curriculum documents some of the activities that you would ex be expected to do with your students um, when doing the design challenges around particular um, activities. So the actual design challenge activity would be um, creating an item of waterproof clothing. And from that, we would be aiming to achieve a whole range of curriculum outcomes. Now, at the very bottom of the pages, I've given some elaborations on how you would turn that into a design challenge task for a level three activity and for a level four um, unit outline activity. But Ben and Cara, how would you go about designing a, or doing a design challenge to create an item of waterproof clothing? Any ideas? How we would do it? Yeah, how would you approach it? Um, <laughs> I, I, I like the whole prototyping thing. Is that viable? It can be. You could get a doll, for example, and try to create a small um, piece of waterproof clothing for, for, them, for the doll yeah. to wear and see if that works before you made a full-size yeah. model. Mm. I was thinking like yeah. things like materials you could find around like wax from a candle or... Mm -hmm. um, you know, recyclable materials and things like that. Yeah. Yes, that's certainly something that would be um, part of it. So generally in the design cycle, the first step would be is defining what the problem is. So yeah. in this case, yeah. um, in all the cases I've given, I've been fairly loose with the problem so that you can actually refine the problem definition yourselves. Yeah. Um, so for example, some, some people interpreted it that they had to have a item of clothing that they could go underwater in. So could dive into a pool and keep themselves perfectly dry. While others interpreted yeah. it as something to keep the rain off. Um, and so there can be a whole range of different ways of defining the problem and the expectations of what is a successful solution to the problem. I guess yeah. through that you can like differentiate and apply the problem to a range of different abilities. Absolutely. That's a very good point. So that for some of your students who might be really struggling, making something out of a garbage bag and put on themselves might be a challenge yeah, for them, yeah. while others who are very adept at sewing and using a whole lot of materials might be far more creative and engaged with doing something at a much more complex level. Um, and they'll be and able to invent something that they can go like underwater with rather than just it raining. Possibly, yes. So there no. can be a whole range of different um, ability levels and that's an important aspect of design challenges. Good design challenges can be done by students in prep all the way through to students at high school. Um, and you'll see, like, say, the bridge building um, activities. 
uh, a student in prep could be making a bridge out of Lego, while a student at university can be making one out of steel girders. Same challenge, mm -hmm. but with different um, expectations that you've set. Mm -hmm. yeah. I totally took, took that a different way. I, I understood it to mean to waterproof, how to, like, uh, to come up with a waterproofing system for existing types of clothing. Okay. Again, another way of interpreting it. So that's why the, the first step is always to define what the problem is that you're going to solve and then specifying what is going to be a successful solution to that problem. Because mm -hmm. that, that then needs to be testable so that when you come to the testing and evaluation stage, you can test that. And a lot of students get in trouble at that point where they um, define a problem or set a, set a task that they're going to do, which is often model making or arts and craft and it can't then easily be tested. And so it's very difficult yeah. then to go through the design cycle um, when you've created an artistic work or a model of something that doesn't actually lend itself to testing. Sometimes it's possible to do that with um, focus groups and experts looking at it and panels and things like that, but it's much more complex than if it's simply a, uh, a solution that's easily testable. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking online too, to see if anyone wants to make a comment or add to our discussion. Mm, not seeing too much at this stage, but we'll keep an eye out for it. <laughs> okay, so once you've defined your problem, and this can be a particularly difficult one for some of the, the digital technologies tasks, because some of those are set out more like a solution. So you have to then construct a problem yeah that leads to that solution, or leads potentially to that solution. Um, and you can put a lot of constraints on these problems so that you can guide students towards doing something that you want them to do. Um, so for example, if you want them to be making something that flies across a certain amount of distance, and you want to be teaching them about paper planes and aerodynamics, you don't really want them making catapults and um, tunneling systems and um, all the other possible solutions to that problem of getting from one location to another. Um, so you can put some constraints in there that's got to be made out of paper, it's got to fly a certain distance above the ground. Um, that will then lead them towards what you want them to um, develop. But sometimes you might want to just give a very open challenge. And in fact, some of the most open challenges let students actually define the entire problem aspect. And that's where we get back to that challenge-based learning examples where the, the very first steps in that were students going out and finding a real world situation that needed solutions developed for it and then coming up with a problem in that environment and then developing that in, into a solution that can then be um, I guess sometimes they need... Oh, main, sorry. You get on. more quality solutions because they are able to have <coughs> full ideas for it rather than being very restricted. Yes, well certainly you get more creative solutions. Yep. Of course, the more um, opportunities you give to students um, to have input into it, the more creative they can be. That said, however, some students do find the very open problems um, inhibiting and putting constraints on something can actually lead to greater creativity. Say building a tower, a tower out of paper. If you give no constraints to that, then a lot of students will just do a very basic tower. But if you say it's got to go at least four meters high um, and can only be made out of 40 sheets of paper, that can actually improve yeah. creativity because they've got to work within those constraints a lot more than if it was simply purely an open uh, problem. So the first st steps there is to define the problem, um, state any assumptions that you put into that, like assumptions that it has to be made out of plastic or it's got to be a certain amount of height or you're going to be, it's got to go very quickly or it's got to fly through the air. So just things that you may think automatically is the case but students might interpret things differently so you should state any assumptions that you want to put into the problem. Then specifying what's going to be a successful solution to that problem. Um, then you go off and you do your research. And this is where you try to find as many possible existing solutions to that problem that already have occurred in the real world, where people have actually explored um, that sort of problem. Uh, and that can be very, very creative ones. So. That research stage is very important because then it leads you into the next point, which is ideation. This is where you come up with as many possible solutions to the problem as you can. 
Now, very often you would have already thought of what you want to do for the solution. Um, so sometimes it can be very difficult to step back and um, be creative in coming up with all those different solutions or different potential solutions. Um, but really try to force yourself to do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy when you're working in groups and teams on it, but you guys are all working individually for this. So, but you have to show that you've gone through that ideation stage. And then you've got to choose I'm one sorry, particular... Sorry, Dave, how much oh, go on. document in our, um, in our own level three calendars? Because we've obviously only got a minimal amount of words. You do, but that could easily be done as a list. Um, so a oh, list okay. of... Say, we don't have to go into specific detail. We could just... No. Like, oh, okay. The one that you do have to go into detail with is the, the reasons why you choose the solution that you want to develop. So that okay. one you should explain in a few sentences, okay? Why out of all of those ones you've described, or listed, did you choose this particular one? What, did, what were the particular advantages that you saw that made you choose that to then develop into a solution? Okay. Um, you can at this point do some prototypes. So if you're not sure about exactly which of those ones you want to develop out, you might try a couple of little very simple prototypes. Um, Say, for example, you were choosing the, uh, for the waterproof clothing example, if you weren't sure about what material to make it out of. You've done your research into what sort of materials are waterproof, but you're not quite sure about how they would actually perform. You might just get some pieces of material and pour water on them just to see which ones are the most effective as little tiny experimental prototypes before you then go and actually turn them into a hat or a piece of clothing and things of that nature. So you can build in some um, testing into, into that sort of stage. But then you go and you actually create your solution. And as you do that, you should describe the problems that you have and how you overcome those problems. Again, only fairly briefly. You've only got like, 400 words um, for the whole lot. So you can't do it in huge detail. But you might want to use some of your video time to show some of those things. You might even use some of the video time to show some of your prototyping. Um, the video doesn't just have to be the final solution. You can't, you've got text and video um, together to do your explanation of the whole process. Um, so there, you, so you're showing the problems that, and how you've overcome them, and then you should have a solution that you can then test, and then your evaluation is how effectively that solution has met the problems that you specified at the beginning. Thank you. And if you think it can be improved, you might go back and do that cycle a couple more times. Uh, you don't have to go all the way back to the beginning to redefining. You might go back to doing a bit more research, or you might just go back to you ideating and choose another one of those that you uh, think might be better now that you've had a, a bit more understanding of what the problem involves. So has anyone got any questions or comments about that process? Because it's very important that you actually show that design process. Um, while we are a little bit interested in the solution, and how, how innovative you are in coming up with a nice solution. 80% of the assignment is about showing that you can go through that process effectively. Okay. Um, with the <coughs> video and the Word document, sorry, can we refer to things in the video and various points in the Word document? Can we do it like absolutely. that or not? Yes, yeah? no, absolutely. You've got how you use those 400 words and use the video is completely up to you. Um, yeah. It's just so that's the time, that's the constraint you've got in order to explain the process and the solution to us um, and to meet okay. the various criteria, which pretty much are those things we just talked about. Yeah. Um, is, is there more of a focus on the uh, coming up with a problem and then working through those initial steps than there is on the of uh, from the say developing prototypes and testing upwards. Um, it def depends a little bit on the prob on the problem that's involved. I'd probably say at least a third should be on the design process in terms of um, problem definition, ideating, looking at the various prototypes, or coming up with a solution and then taking it on. Um, there generally won't be an awful lot to document on the actual construction. There may be a little bit, but normally that can be done very quickly with a couple of um, photos, a little bit of video, or, or some document, or some writing. So yeah. I wouldn't do too much on the actual production step. 
there should be a reasonable bit on testing and how you've actually gone about yeah. determining whether or not it's been a successful solution. Um, and I certainly wouldn't say more than a third or a quarter on actually demonstrating the, the solution. Of course, a lot of that should be evident from how you've described things during the production and definition phases. Okay. So we should have a reasonable yeah. understanding of what the product solution is going to be by having gone through that process. Um, but it's always good at the end to demonstrate an actual working solution or product that you've actually created that solves the problem. Yeah. And then, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. No, no, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> So I'm just seeing, I've got a couple more questions here from Kimberly. We choose two activities for the design challenge D and T F to two. Um, now, Kimberly, you've got you've got to do two level three activities from any of the modules. So mm -hmm. you may choose to do one from design and technology um, F to two. And in fact, if you really want, you can even do both from design and technology F to two, if you really wished, from the list of activities there. Um, the only danger with doing both from the same module is that if you make the same mistake um, in both, there's, there's less opportunity for variation. So that if you choose them from different modules, there's more likelihood that you'd only make the mistake in one of the modules. And so you wouldn't, there'd still be some opportunity for us to give you credit for whatever aspect you've failed to do. Um, but if you choose two very similar activities, say from the same module, then the likelihood of you making the same mistake and then um, definitely losing the marks for that would be higher. Checking if we've got any other messages there. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so there's a whole range of design and technology and digital technology activities. Um, so we've talked about the, the one for waterproof clothing. In D&T 3 to 4, the example I've put there is on the paddle prop bridge one, which is a very common design and technology challenge, where you've got to use paddle prop sticks to make a bridge to span a particular distance and have a particular, support a particular weight. And because this is a very popular challenge, there's actually even computer software available that you can download and try out your designs um, before you actually build them. And that's a great way of prototyping. So if you've got some, some um, tools like that available, you can very quickly make a couple of dozen prototypes in a few minutes, whereby if you had to do them physically, um, it would be very difficult to make lots of prototypes and test out ideas. Um, but when you've got simulation software, that can be done very quickly and effectively. And so in that case, you might spend a lot more time on the prototyping stage, working out your ideas and based upon your research and the different ways of connecting uh, materials and using different materials and joining things and creating trusses out of triangles and cubes and things of that nature. Um, but instead of going straight to the production phase and then trying out one or two designs and seeing them fail and learning from that, you can do a whole lot of designs quickly on a computer simulation and see what is more likely to work in real life. Um, and by mistake, I actually did another one in that module for, um, which one was it? Uh, the formal dress out of plastic bags. So there's two actual examples there. The formal dress module was, um, activity was really meant to be for F to 2. But as with many design challenges, they can be done at different year levels. And in fact, this formal dress activity I've seen done at year 11 and 12 um, level at, in schools where they've been making uh, co um, do do? costumes and home economic activities. But that's, a, again, a very common popular activity, making um, a costume or a a, an item of clothing out of recycled materials, in this case, plastic bags. And there's a number of video clips there showing various solutions that people have done. And it's an opportunity to be creative, but also to learn about materials, to learn about different ways of joining materials, about the durability of items. So when you come to specify what makes a good solution, um, you need to think through, OK, what sort of things are going to be testable? So for an item of clothing, um, its durability, how well it 
how well it stays together, uh, whether or not it's transparent, um, how it reacts in, in the rain, for example, are all things that can be tested. Now, Cara, what was the one you decided upon again? Um, I did the Rube Goldberg machine. Okay, yep. So yep. let's have a look at that one. Um, that was D and T, or sorry, DT3, DT. I think it was. The F to 2 one. Oh, F to 2. Whoops. Let's find it. Yes, D DT3, F to 2. So here you're creating a. Oh, Cara, how about you explain it? Well, you're creating. You're doing something very simple with a very complex process. So there's lots of examples. I think the ones online on the module, they're ringing a bell and they do it through lots of dominoes, lots of funnels, lots of all of those things. So in my one, I'm turning a CD player on with lots and lots of processes in between. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so again, it's an opportunity to be creative. It's an opportunity to to research lots of different ways of having these trigger events occur, um, yeah. ideating lots of different possibilities, choosing the range of possibilities that you want to use, then trying them out. Yeah, um, yeah prototyping like different sections of it. So mm -hmm. like seeing if this one works well and it goes on to this one well or whether it just doesn't work and whether it yeah. needs to be taken out and yeah. So it's a great one for particularly for younger students Although, again, it can be used at any year level, but there's a fantastic opportunity for failure during this task. And failure is yes. a really important part of design and design challenges. <laughs> we really want the students to be failing before they achieve success, because that then makes it a challenge. If the whole idea of design challenges is there's the design section, where that's the creativity and coming up with new ideas and allowing students to be engaged with that design process. But then there's the challenge aspect, whereby it has to be something that challenges them and so they feel a great sense of success and achievement when they actually get it working. And yep. simple ones like the Rube Goldberg machine, although they can be very complex, um, allows lots of failure without it being seen as a, as a big negative because the students know yeah. that they're going to work through it and eventually get success. Yeah, and they can fail in little bits. Yep. So like m my second step completely failed, but then I was able to re-go over it and... That was the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. So make sure you document that because that whole process of showing how you overcome problems is an important part of the design challenge process. And when yeah. you're marking students' work, that's actually a very important aspect to be marking. Um, and we're learning a lot more about how to actually mark creativity and innovation in that way. And part of that is tenacity and overcoming um, disappointment and failures. Um, now I've got another comment from Bev online. She's knitted a tie out of plastic bags, so doing the formal piece of item. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a full formal um, dress. It can be a more complex individual item of clothing. And I've seen some very, um, very effective pieces of clothing done um, using some very complex techniques, such as knitting and um, an awful lot of stuff done with melting and um, compressing plastic and melting oh, sections wow. of plastic together can be done to be very creative ways. So I look forward to seeing how the tie has turned out. Um, let me just check to see if anyone else has made some comments online. Okay, we've got something from Kimberly. You can see other activities in other modules. Thanks for the info, though. Okay, good. Um, so a couple of the other activities that we've got online. Uh, some other ones I showed put on there. There's the emergency shelter one, which again is quite popular, where the challenge is to, um, that in a disaster or for homeless people, they need somewhere that they can sleep in that keeps them warm and keeps the rain off and things of that nature, keeps them safe. And there's a whole lot of challenges available to come up with different sorts of tents or structures or containers, sometimes on wheels, sometimes not, and a whole range of different things that can be put into place that students at even quite a young age can design. Of course, they've had some experience with cubby houses and things like that, so it's not too great a conceptual leap, but they still have to do research into what's needed in terms of a, um, some sort of accommodation. And I've even seen this very 
successfully done by linking it into um, indigenous studies, by looking at how native communities around the world have created different sorts of um, structures to keep the rain off and to keep themselves dry and so forth, um, and using those ideas to help with coming up with creative solutions for homeless or disaster situations. But again, it's the process that they're going through that's uh, far more important than the actual solutions that they may come up with. Particularly nowadays with the internet, because generally students will find lots and lots of examples of good solutions on the internet. Um, so you want them to do that. You want to acknowledge that as part of the process, but then to use that to try to come up with their own new innovative ways of solving the problem. Often just by combining other existing ones, but the more creative students will come up with uh, more interesting and innovative approaches that you may not have even seen before. Mm. Okay, um, Kimberly asks what the activity was that was just being explained, and that was, I believe that was when um, Cara was explaining it, that was the Rube Goldberg machine, which is in module D and DT3 for F to 2. Um, so in particular it's used for helping students understand the concept of sequence, um, which is one of our introductory concepts in computational thinking, or algorithmic thinking in this particular case. Now for DT3 to 4, um, I've set a challenge there of writing a computer program in Scratch, or a, sorry, a, an adventure story. So uh, like those choose your own adventure stories, um, we've got some animated characters, and using the very simple Scratch programming language, creating a story whereby the animated characters move around on the screen and speak, use speech bubbles or voiceovers, and then by clicking on various buttons and activities that you might want to have, or moving the characters around, um, triggering, triggering events that will then allow them to choose different pathways through a story. And there's lots of examples where that can be done. And again, a nice simple activity, but teaching the concept of selection, which is one of the next concepts in programming, um, in algorithmic thinking. Um, what other ones have we got to show, talk about? Okay. <coughs> so each of the modules has got quite a range of different activities that you can choose from. Um, most of them, particularly the design and technology ones, are couched around the concept of a problem. But some of the ones, particularly in digital technologies, because the curriculum document hasn't necessarily been written um, particularly well around them being challenges, uh, something that I'm actually going to Darwin this weekend to talk to Akara and discuss the um, technologies curriculum, and we'll be highlighting that particular thing that we've sort of learnt through this course about some of the problems with the digital technologies not quite matching the design process that is very strong with the design and technology activities. Um, so oh. some of the digital Sorry. technologies ones, oh, go on. I remembered what I was going to ask now. Um, oh good. Which is in relation to what you're talking about. The, um, so the, the design challenge for digital technology with the list, so one of them was to sort of design a website. As part of the design process, can you talk about other solutions which were not to design the website, even though that's what we're supposed to be doing according to the design challenge? Yes, you may. And that's where you define the problem. So I've, the, many of the digital technologies ones are really sort of a solution. Um, yeah. So what you do is you step before that and you define a problem that could lead to that solution, but it could also lead to other potential solutions. Okay. And in your defining of the problem and then your research and your ideation, you can describe those other uh, potential solutions as well. Yeah. So it could be, for example, publishing a book or yes. uh, something completely not associated with digital technology at all. Um, yes. Although, remember, <coughs> particularly as a teacher, when you um, define and specify the problem, you'll, you'll put in place certain restrictions to lead students to where you want them to go in order to achieve learning outcomes. Okay. Um, now, sometimes you might make it very, very open, particularly with some advanced students or, say, at the end of the year and things like that. But more often than not, there, there's going to be certain learning outcomes you want to see achieved, and so you'll need to direct them towards that to a certain okay. extent. Yep. Um, so that's probably the 
the other aspect, particularly when we come now to talk about the level four tasks, where the majority of level four tasks are based around doing up a unit outline. Um, so your unit outline is is not a full blown unit plan, which is made up of a whole lot of um, lesson plans and um, is really a big summary of the syllabus and, or curriculum documents. It's probably best to think of it as telling a story. So you've got to think 1,100 words, and you're going to tell a story about what you're going to do with your students for the semester. And that might be five hours for the very young students, or 20 hours, or 30 hours, depending upon what year level um, you're choosing the, the unit um, outline to be discussing. And there's so three aspects how much, you need to oh, go on. So, so, so how much detail do we need to do that? Do we need to describe um, what they're doing at, in like particular times? Like in the first hour, we do this, or do you just not so much like that? There's different ways of approaching it. Um, yeah. Say for if you, say for the very early years, where you've only got five or five or so hours, then you might be very specific and. Um, it might turn into more of a lesson plan, although I would hope not. Um, it's the, the three things you have to incorporate are the learning activities that the students will engage with, and generally that will be a design challenge, and there may be some associated activities ab about that challenge. So some skills that they might have to develop, say, say if the challenge is going to involve um, creating a t-shirt, then you might do some mini activities before that on learning how to use a sewing machine um, or threading a needle or things of that nature or even um, sketching out onto a piece of cloth the outline of a t-shirt. Um, so there might be some skill based things that you would do before you let the students go ahead with the challenge. But then you would set them a problem to do and structure it through. So you can use the same design challenges that you've done for your level three activities um, and you can base your um, unit outline around those. But really, you're just describing, as though you were going to describe it to your family or to, to another teacher, what sort of things are you going to do with your students for that semester? That's where you show innovation. So here, what we're looking for in particular is how innovative you are in coming up with interesting ideas for your students to do for the semester. Okay. Thank you. So if you just choose boring standard ones, you'll get a good solid pass. But if you go off and you sort of come up with interesting new things that you could think of for your students to do and interesting learning activities and design challenges for them to work through, that would be better. Um, okay. The second thing you have to show is that the students are actually going to address some of the curriculum outcomes. So some of the knowledge and understanding and process and skills from either the design and technology or digital technologies curriculum documents. So. In each of the examples I've been showing you, I've been highlighting in red the various things that you could be drawing out from the actual curriculum documents that would relate to the particular design challenges involved. So you would do a similar thing to that. But again, this will be a little bit list-like, but try to actually explain it. Why did you actually choose those ones? Um, why did you choose to include these particular ones? Or you might even explain why you chose not to include certain things. Um, but here you're showing that you can actually draw material out of a curriculum document and address that in a unit outline. So it will relate to the description of the unit um, that you've described in the first section, but then you just define, and you can intermix these if you really wish, but more often than not it's done separately. Um, and then finally, and for that one I'm particularly looking at how you've interpreted the curriculum documents. So how you've chosen um, things out of the curriculum documents that relate to the activities you want to do with your students. And then finally, a section on how are you going to assess this. How are you going to actually go about working out whether or not the students have achieved those, those curriculum outcomes and achieved the learning involved. And that's an analysis aspect. So those three things are what are ex expected. So while there exists very complex templates for doing um, detailed unit planning. Um, this is much more a unit outline. So what I've found in the past is that with unit planning, students have spent more, more time just cutting and pasting stuff and filling in little boxes um, with very generic statements 
without really having an understanding overall of what they're going to be doing with their students. So I really want you just to explain what are you going to do with your students for a semester? How are they going to learn some stuff about design and technology or digital technologies? And how are you going to assess that to see whether or not that learning has actually occurred? Can I just clarify? Um, mm -hmm. Can I do my Rube Goldberg one even though you've taken it apart in the you may. module? Yeah. And also with the assessment thing, you don't. How much detail do we go into that? Do we need to do a criteria <coughs> sheet? Do we need to do any of that stuff or not? No, you don't need to go into criteria sheets and um, example assessment. Um, but the main thing is, the main thing I'm looking for here is the connection between assessment and the learning outcomes. So okay. looking at what you want the students to learn, and then how is it best to assess that, and describing that. Describing your reasoning. So, if, for example, in the Rube Goldberg thing, you were, students were mostly learning about sequencing of events and that certain events can cause other events to occur, then yeah. assessing that um, might be done through students explaining that verbally, um, or they might be given a series of little problems and have to demonstrate one that does it in a sequence. Or, but you need to go through and explain some way you're going to assess that particular concept. Yeah. Um, so just saying you're going to use a test or showing a test wouldn't be a good explanation. Um, I'd have to infer an awful lot about your understanding by just looking at a piece of uh, a test instrument. Um, but you explaining why you've used this test to to de to for students to demonstrate knowledge about some particular concept that would be what I would be after. So you don't have to necessarily show the test item. So a lot of it's why. Yes. We don't just do what we do the why as well. Yep. The why is probably the most important. Like the what would get you a pass, but to get the higher level grades, the why is what we're looking at. Yeah. Because that shows your understanding. Yeah. Okay, just checking if we've got any other comments online. Um, Okay, so Bev's a bit concerned that her tie's a bit hard to tie. Um, <laughs> so also, a unit plan would be just be a straight written document. Yes, just like well, you can use dot points though. Um, you, so you can still summarize things where it's important to summarize. So it doesn't have to be purely essay format, um, but it's an explanation. So it's not a table, um, or it's not what you would see as many unit plans which is a table document where you're filling in lots of um, fields. It's much more of an explanatory document. Uh, just going through and checking if there's got some more questions here. Um, so Kimberly asks, do you, and can you do a voiceover on Scratch? Um, you can have recordings in Scratch. Uh, um, so there's two aspects of voiceover. You can have in Scratch trigger events which will play little movies or voice clips and so you can have things occur in the actual story um, that will be auditory. The other thing though is when you actually go to demonstrate your solution, remember you've got 400 words and three minutes of video, generally you'll do some screen recordings of your Scratch program and in that you can annotate a voiceover explaining how your Scratch program works. Um, so you don't just submit your Scratch program, you submit a video of you demonstrating your Scratch program and voice-overing voice -overing that to um, explain the various aspects that you want to highlight. Most people aren't going to know how to screen capture. Okay, well, okay, that's a good point. I'll provide some resources on and maybe another little video clip on doing that. It's, it's a very simple process and um, if you've got a Mac, you've already got the software installed, and for Windows machines, it's some very simple software to download. You can also download some online screen recording software um, that will do it for you. But it's a very good point, Ben. I'll put up an, a a, um, a video explanation on how to do a screen record. Yeah. Let me just see if we've got some other questions. Um, can I ask with the the challenge that I'm doing, is it worth doing the Stanford 90-minute crash course? 
or just following the documents that you have? Um, for your level four activity? Yeah. Now, for the level four activity, if you want to do the design challenge for that one, you would need to use the Stanford material. Um, okay. Any material I've put on about that would have been drawn straight from the Stanford material anyhow. So, um, but yes, for that, you, it's a very different process to the one we've been describing here for the other design challenges. Yep. Of course, we're doing a very, very much more simplified, generic design challenge process. The Stanford one is very specific, um, yep. and it's much more focused around a client and client needs and achieving a aim that way. Um, just as a challenge-based learning approach is somewhat different again. Um, it uses different approaches and different philosophies behind it. Um, with the level four, do you need to... Um, what am I, um, do we assume that they have previous knowledge of design challenges, or do we not that's assume you, that? That's, well, for your level three and your level four, you can put that into your assumptions. So okay, for your level yep. three, again, if you want to assume that students already know how to sew, um, or have done design challenges in previous years, which with our new Australian curriculum should be an assumption, but of course in the yep. first few years it's going to be an incorrect assumption in some cases, because that may not have occurred. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but <laughs> ideally, with the new technology um, curriculum going in place, you will be able to assume in years, say five and six, that they've done several design challenges in years three and four, and in years one and two, or in F to, yeah. to two. So, um, yeah, go on. So, with the level threes, do we need to say how we would teach it, or just how we no. did it? No, it's no. just how you do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you. That's where the, the level four task is where you explain the teaching aspect of it and how that integrates in. For the level three, and it's it's really you doing the cha the challenge. Yeah, and finally, with the level four, do we need to do a lot on like differentiation and high level students and students which struggle with it or not? Well, that's what you would put into your learning activities and explain yeah. the sorts of learning activities and how you would structure those. And yes, yeah. a, a really good design challenge and also good teaching practice would take into account um, differentiation. So we will be talking a bit more about that as we go through the weeks. Because um, being able to differentiate design challenges is one of, is one of their strengths. Um, of course, design challenges can, as we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, um, can be molded to accommodate different capability levels students. Um, and it's only very, very specific design challenges that lose that capability. So I've just got a couple of other questions online here. Um, one from Ashley having some difficulties attaching a video of her puppet. Um, uh, but I think that's just a more general comment outside of this lecture. <laughs> Okay, and okay, so let's just recap a few things. Um, so for the level three tasks, you're going through that design cycle, um, and that cycle needs to include the first stage, which is defining the problem, um, defining any assumptions that you've got, specifying it as a problem, and specifying the conditions under which it will be successful so that they can then be measured in the testing phase. Um, most students that have difficulty with design challenges fail on that point where they create a design challenge which can't be tested. Um, so if you're doing something that can't be tested, very often it's an arts activity or some other activity. Um, so for example, creating a volcano for geography is a fantastic activity for geography um, but it's not, a, it's not a technology education activity. Um, similarly, creating a, a, a website um, may be a fantastic activity. I say creating a website for a blog might be a great activity for um, English, but unless it's got a design process where you're using it to solve a problem, which isn't that hard to define and specify in that way, but, but if you aren't doing it, if you're just doing it as a skill-based activity, then it's really just using ICT for another curriculum area. So design challenge or de technology education should incorporate a design challenge. 
Now that said, the current curriculum document um, for some digital technologies activities don't necessarily have to be done as design challenges, although for this assignment, for your level three tasks, I have asked you to all do them as design challenges. Um, that when you get out in schools, you may find there's times when you simply do them as skill-based activities, such as learning how to create a spreadsheet and populating it and so forth. Um, it's quite easy to turn that into a design challenge, but the current curriculum document doesn't mandate that, although I'm certainly leading you towards doing it that way um, in this course. Can we send, like if we've come up with a problem for our design challenge, especially if it's in DT, can we send it to our uh, tutors to verify that it would be appropriate? Absolutely. And it's an important aspect for this course in that the tutors are there to assist you and to give you ideas and to prompt you and to push you forward and sometimes rein you back. Um, so Ben, some of your things are going probably beyond the requirements of the course. So you'd be one that I would probably be aiming to pull back a little bit in terms of some of the things that you're um, doing. While they're great things to do, and if you've got time and can do them within the constraints of the course, that's great, but they are in some respects going beyond what's required. So mm -hmm. just, yeah, sometimes we get students that get very, very caught up in doing some activities, like creating computer games and things like that, and, and just spend way too much time beyond what's the requirements of the course um, for that. But for most students, we do need to push them a little bit in terms of setting something that's challenging for them. So it's very easy to set up, to choose something that you already know you can do. But choosing something that you're just not quite sure about is a much more effective um, approach and actually will get you better marks in this course because then you'll be able to show in the design process how you've been challenged and how you've overcome things and um, much more easily than if you try to fake that um, so I've seen, literally I've seen thousands of these design challenges now um, and it's quite easy to tell when students have chosen something that they could already do and are just sort of um, showing some problems or trying to force some problems into the process. Um, okay, just looking at some other couple of questions. Um, oh, someone's asking something. Yeah. Okay, looks like we've answered most of those. Do you guys have any other questions? You? Um, I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we need to encourage a few more of your peers to join us on these um, sessions so we have a little bit more <laughs> vibrant discussion. I was kind of having there be a few more this week because this is probably of all the weeks the most important video or discussion to actually everyone to watch. Um, of course, this, this is where you can actually make some significant mistakes and fail the level three and four tasks if you don't do them as design challenges. Um, if you still see them as a level two task where you're just creating a product without going through that cycle, then you'll only get about at most a quarter of the marks for the tasks. So it's very important that everyone um, looks at things from that perspective. Yeah, after this lecture, I think I need to go back to the original process of mine and just try and more get more down for the starting Absolutely. defining and yeah. Yeah. remember you've got quite a few weeks to go yet for, before this is due uh, and we're going to spend more time discussing these as we go through the next few weeks and clarifying stuff plus of course you've got your tutors who are all very experienced educators who have done design challenges before and know what it's like to be involved in them um, but the big thing is that it's the process that's important um, Really, we don't care if students can create, can do all of these different tasks. Yeah. It's them learning about the process and being innovative and creative and knowing that they can overcome problems and develop solutions to problems. That's the real power of technology's education. Okay, well, I'm sort of running out of things to talk about here. I was hoping there'd be a bit more conversation with some more people. So if anyone's got any more questions online, please ask them. Uh, let me see. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I have one. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> the, back to the website again. Yep. You're saying the solution is not so much the um, 
the be all and end all of the like it's more about the design process and does that mean like I'm uh, saying not I shouldn't be spending too much time on some things I'm sort of spending too much time on writing content for this thing that I'll probably never use again so can I use someone else's content or something or, or uh, like ramp it up a lot no you, you still have to the solution has to be yours um, but it's what you define as a solution is or define as the problem and specify that you can uh, modify so for example you might for a website just do part of a website um, whereby you use some existing material and only do a small section of that that's um, your innovative contribution to the oh. website so I say say I, I have a framework that I've built I could like use that as a template and teach them how to do the rest of it based off that template okay so so your problem is as you define is to teach someone else how to create a website a simple that, website a simple website that does something okay yeah. um, so you're creating a website that teaches about how to create a website yeah yep okay so again there yes you could use some template material so you don't necessarily have to create all of that yourself um, I, like, because they still have to populate the website themselves with their own content so I'm making the content a more important part of the yep. the, um, the end user solution I guess which module was that task from let me just check to make sure I don't contradict myself in terms of the task uh, I think it's DT6 DT6 okay, one sec yeah, it is. So it's design, create, and evaluate an educational website using HTML that uses cascading style sheets of at least 10 pages. Yeah. So for that, the main things I'd be looking for in terms of the solution is that you've decided to do it using cascading style sheets over other alternatives. Yep. So you could have looked at doing it as a static website or um, other sort of solutions, and you've chosen the cascading style sheets for a particular reason. Um, yep. Got to be ten pages, so it's just sort of give it some, some s stuff, and you've got to have gone into the HTML. So you can't have just used pure template or design tools, but you've actually had to go in and do some HTML coding. Yep. Um, but I don't necessarily have to teach the person that I'm teaching how to create a basic website how to code HTML. That's no. That's the task, fun. yeah, the so, task wasn't necessarily about teaching someone something. It was about as, yeah. creating an educational website. Yep. Um, so you could do that in almost any context. Um, could be about pirates, um, yep. and <laughs> so yeah. So don't read too much into the task beyond yep. what's needed. Okay. Uh, and then, and again, there's and there's no stipulation on how much content is required on each of those ten pages either. No, it was just that I had to put something in there to make sure that it had sort of relatively the equivalent to about. Um, 700 words, so yep. 10 pages seemed about a reasonable amount. And also okay. that's needed to show cascading style sheets effectively. If you have too few pages, you can't really show um, the effectiveness of cascading style sheets. Yep. Um, I've got a question from Kimberly. Is it okay to design if the design challenge we do has mistakes as long as we can show how we overcame them? Absolutely. And in fact, if you don't have any mistakes, um, it can be very difficult to actually achieve some of the criteria. So in you actually going through the process of coming up with your solution you should actually make some mistakes and if in the unfortunate circumstance that you don't make any mistakes go back and put some in so that it looks as though you've made some mistakes um, uh, although ideally you would have challenged yourself to a level whereby you will make some mistakes and overcome those um, do we have to video the mistakes or can we just talk about mistakes you could just talk about them or video them depending upon how it fits into your context um, Probably it's a good idea to video a whole lot. Um, four minutes of video, is it three or four? Um, but three, three or four minutes of video is actually quite a lot of time. Um, do short little clips of things. Don't spend a whole lot of time videoing the same thing sitting there doing nothing. Um, if you edit your video reasonably effectively, you can show an awful lot in three minutes. Yeah. Uh, the other part was such as when I made, a, made the kite for level two, I had to make three to see which worked better depending upon size. Absolutely. So part of your design process, and again, a really good 
demonstration of an understanding of the design cycle is actually going through making a mistake, realizing you've got to go back to an earlier point in the design cycle, going back to that, re-engaging with the cycle, such as maybe doing some more research or looking at other ideation ideas or, or choosing another um, option that you'd come up with before, and then going back through the construction process again is a really important way of showing you understand the design cycle. So mistakes are good. This is one, probably one of the few times when you'll be rewarded for making mistakes. Uh, again, with the mistakes, or what about if you've done something and you then come up with a more efficient way or a better way of doing it? Is that absolutely? That's again, that's what we term a mis well. Mistakes don't have to always be negative. Um, if you discover that there's a better way of doing something, then you've learned. Generally, your problem is to do things the most efficient or effective way. So, having discovered a particular way is less efficient and sometimes you might say okay I think I can do this more efficiently and you try something else but it turns out not to be as efficient and then you go back to your previous solution as your final solution so there's okay. various ways of going through that cycle um, it's looking there's two ways of looking at mistakes one is looking at it as though something that has to be fixed or it won't solve the problem at all but more often um, you you, you come up with a partial solution that you think that it can then be improved upon and so you go back to the cycle again um, to improve that because you would have learnt a lot by going through the cycle the first time Okay. just as you would for any drafting process for writing um, whenever you do a written essay you can always do better the second time through the same with um, design challenges Okay. Okay. It looks like I can't see any other questions being asked, and we're just about out of time. Oops, one from Kelly. Um, looks like she just made some a big mess in the lounge room or something. Uh, okay. So I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, remember, you can ask questions during the week, and of course, you can. Um, ask questions of your tutors and they'll be more than willing to help you. The idea of this course is that we'll be randomizing who marks your level three and four tasks and the purpose of that is so that you can get as much assistance as you um, can try to from your tutors who will give you ideas and push you in different directions. Now they won't do the things for you and I always give a caveat, particularly for myself, as I, I normally never give advice beyond students getting a pass or a credit. Um, Sometimes I do with these tasks, but I won't help you get a high distinction or distinction. Those sort of levels you really should be working at yourself. Um, but you can always ask questions and seek clarifications and um, ideas and so forth. But if you come, come to me and say, I've got no idea what to do, can you please give me an idea? I'll give you something that will probably get you a pass. Um, but you shouldn't expect to get more than that from coming up from those sort of questions. Okay then, well, I'll see everyone next week. And thank you very much for Ben and for Kara for being on the panel this week. Thank you. Bye-bye all.